As I mentioned before, this was uh, an exciting moment for Piers and Fyodor and I especially. It was our first flight, and we were grinning as we were walking out to the Astro van, getting ready to go to the pad. Interestingly enough, on that day, there was one cloud in Florida and was over the pad. We got out to the pad, and it was raining, but we got up and went into the orbiter anyway. I was the last one in the vehicle, so I had some time to stand at the 195-foot level and just think about what we are going to do and listen to the orbiter kind of hiss and moan and groan, and it was ready to go to orbit, and so were we. It's kind of funny, you're so excited to go and you get out there and you get into the orbiter and you still have about two hours or so where you're laying Eight, in the back waiting for the countdown. take a breath before I could do my MS-2 duties. There was a lot of excitement about our flight about this camera view on the external tank and we heard once we got to orbit that it looked spectacular, but unfortunately we couldn't view it till we got down, so it was really neat video. But here we are and we're, we got the kick in the seat, we're going and we're just really loud noises, roaring, rattling, vibrating, that's all you could feel as you were sitting on the flight deck. I had a mirror, I was trying to look out the overhead window to see where the ground was at, but it was a little distracting just with all the vibration, with all the vibration going on. We settled down to watch the engines and waited for SRB SEP, and uh, when SRB SEP came, it was quite surprising. It was a really loud flash and a bang. And I couldn't help it. I had to say wow because it was so unexpected. It was just such a loud bang. We, uh, we had a smoother ride after that it was it, once the SRBs were gone. 50 nautical miles. And then we hit the 50 we nautical mile six, point. Guys. And that's the point where Piers and Fyodor and I became flown astronauts. Eight and a half minutes we were to orbit and we got to work turning the orbiter into a, turn this, the rocket into an orbiter so we could uh, start with our mission. Open the payload bay doors and we were off and running. Almost immediately, we begin the rendezvous process, which takes about two days of, of uh, burns to approach the space station. Uh, I'm up there in the front, along with my core rendezvous team, Dave Wolf, who's a former ice cream salesman, uh, Pierce Sellers, the snail farmer, and Pam Melroy, who we call Tank Girl. Imagine how that would feel. We're all on the flight deck here. We all have a lot to do. It's very crowded. We're looking out two tiny windows as we travel along at 17,500 miles an hour, both vehicles traveling that speed. This picture is about 45 minutes before docking. Uh, you can see that we're closing very, very slowly to the space station. It's magnificent as you move in and look out those windows and look at the International Space Station hanging uh, above Earth's atmosphere. It's brilliant. The color is very metallic and looks almost like molten metal. It's so bright in the, uh, in the bright rays of the sun. As we move in, things gradually get more and more uh, exciting until we finally reach the space station, feel the thunk, and we dock. We know we've made it a very critical event uh, accomplished safely. It takes about an hour to pull these two pieces together and to pressurize the area in between and do all the checks, and then it's time to open the hatches. And what a treat it is to rendezvous and then open the hatch to living people. The crew had been up there about four months when we opened this hatch and uh, talking to other crews they say that the most important thing for them is seeing new faces and uh, the second most important thing is food and the salsa we brought in a pecan pie and the third thing is mail. We didn't have a whole lot of time to meet and greet and say hello because we had to immediately get to work and transfer all of the spacewalk equipment over to the station airlock and we were busy, busy, busy flying back and forth to take a piece parts of the spacesuit, put them together, put the tools on the spacesuits and there was just a lot of work we had to do at the end of that flight day three after we docked. And of course, right away when we got up on the morning of flight day four, the EVA guys got to work doing their pre-breathe and getting their exercise in for their spacewalk prep and Peggy and I got to work on the S1 install. It was, it was going to be a long day for us, and we got to work with the unberth. And it does take two people to fly that arm. There's a lot going on there. You've got to manage the camera views. You have to do the actual flying, keep an eye on the procedures. There's calm between the ground, calm between the shuttle. Just a whole lot of work. We actually stopped uh, a couple times and put the brakes on so we could fly over to the shuttle windows and look out the pilot's window and see what the 30,000 pound truss looked like at the end of the Canada arm because the whole time we were only flying from camera views and it was really beautiful to go look out the window and see what the truss looked like and out there hanging over the edge of this, the shuttle payload bay. 
Well, we worked through the procedures. There are some great procedures, and we got up and got the install done. And once the install wasn't done, we attached this truss with some bolts to the S0 truss and reconfigured for the EVA. Meanwhile, back in the airlock, the EVA team are imprisoned still on their uh, masks. When the pressure's down, we squirm into our spacesuits, and uh, Pam and Fyodor have put the final touches. You can see being gentle with us there. And it comes the moment to put on the helmets, and there's a final clunk, which is, means helmet on for the next 10 hours. And we're sealed in there good. Fyodor and Pam check out the lights, all the extra equipment, one last look over everything, and then it's time to cram us into the airlock. But before that, we all, before that, we all pagan rites to appease the EVA gods. <laughs> These little ceremonies are very, very important to ensure mission success <laughs> if you do them right. Shove one guy in face first so that he's facing the hatch. Put in all the luggage, shove the other guy in feet first. And there's just enough room to basically not scratch your nose because you can't. Close the hatch. And then it's another hour, and then you're ready to go out. Now, this is an exciting moment. Opening the hatch, it's a 240-mile drop, so don't let go. Squirm out, look around, grab a handrail, and then get to work. A lot of distractions. Here's a night pass. We've got thunderstorms going on below us. We're meant to be working, but sometimes it's just irresistible to sneak a peek at what's going on down there. Manhandling bits of equipment, moving them around, fighting with each other occasionally. No, not really. Then using power tools to bolt things in position. A lot of heavy work, uh, particularly on EVA-1. It's good that we had our tools checked out in a thoroughly professional manner by EV-1. And this is really the only way to get things done. We make our way out at times to the very end of the truss, and we call this the end of the world, and it really feels like you're out there. That's a camera group that we installed. We work together as a team, and that's the view back. You can see the shuttle inverted at the top, looking back through the truss. Remember that we have one tether on, and Pam is choreographing our activities the whole time with a detailed checklist from inside. Even though we're alone out there, it really uh, feels with uh, Sandy and Pam and the ground uh, like you have real support. This is, we ride the arm that, that Sandy is driving much of the time to do the detailed work. And if you happen to look, dare to look down, which I tried to avoid, tried to mainly focus on the station, you could get to these incredible views which if you let yourself, you can get kind of lost in. There's the empty payload bay. It used to have the truss inside, the laboratory module, the airlock that we have just come out of and we'll go back into after eight or nine hours total time, seven hours outside. There's the truss that has been installed. We have many tools and bags of equipment to keep organized, and they're all on separate tethers, and it can be a challenge keeping that straight. This is an antenna that we installed, and you'll see how quickly it goes from day to night at the same time going from plus 200 degrees to minus 200 degrees. Takes a little temperature adjustment. We're very tired after a little over seven hours outside in this case. We come inside, and we're just happy to be hung on the wall and let Pam and Fyodor do their magic, let us rest, and uh, get us unsuited. You can see as the lower torso comes off this suit, that white garment has thousands of cooling water tubes that keep us air conditioned. We're looking forward to a good hearty meal after all that. This is the service module, a great place to congregate and eat. It's very homey. There's the table, and you'll see Sandy in her natural inverted perch. <laughs> she had an amazingly quick adaptation to zero G. Sergey filling from the rushing galley a food container, cans of food. The real purpose of this space station, of course, is to do science. And here Jeff is doing a physics experiment. And you can really see the different behavior and properties of materials where surface tension dominates. And our, this, this space station is truly an international laboratory bringing 17 countries together to ultimately do research in physics, material science, biology, plant biology in this case, where experiments to learn to grow uh, plants for long duration so we can go to Mars and have more natural fresh food. And it's fun for the scientists too, as Sandy demonstrates in the laboratory with her own experiment. 
Well, let's take you on a little tour of the station as it is right now. That's a picture of Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space. This is the service module. Sergey is showing us his bedroom. Uh, that's actually his bedroom, that little closet area there. You see pictures of his family. You can see his personal gear. And that white bag against the wall is his sleeping bag. That's where he spends the night. The service module is a very homey place, as, as Dave said. You saw the pictures on the wall. It's got kind of green carpeting everywhere. It's sort of cozy and warm and a little bit dark. It, uh, it feels like going to visit somebody's house. And this is the part of the house that you wouldn't ordinarily see. I think everybody has a place like this in their house. This is the closet of the space station. And you can see it's piled high with uh, boxes. Most of that is actually food. As we get towards the end of the closet area, this is the FGB module. You'll actually see some towels on the wall. That's where the station crew does their uh, daily sponge bath. And now as we go into the American segment of the space station, you can see that it feels very different than the Russian segment. It's very bright and airy, kind of metallic. It looks a lot more like an office space. And we'll take a quick peek here into the airlock, which is what you've seen a lot of earlier. That's where the spacewalks were conducted out of. And now we're going to float along a little bit further into what I think of as the crown jewel of the U.S. segment. This is the U.S. laboratory, very aptly named Destiny, because the destiny of the space station is to do science in space. And the walls are crammed with experiments. Peggy is actually doing a little bit of sto stowage here for some of the things that we brought over for her. But uh, this uh, laboratory is a magic place to do science, and it's a wonderful place to be in the station that has both a place to live and a place to work. Now we're going to take a crazy little jink and go over here into the space shuttle. And here we are on the mid-deck of the space shuttle, which uh, is a combination kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, and living room for us. Jeff is making some dinner while Sandy is looking at her checklist to make sure we haven't left anything that we shouldn't have aboard the space station. Fyodor's taking a little coffee break there after having helped Sandy move some of these big bags back and forth between the shuttle and the station. And now we'll go up into the kind of the office area, the business end of the shuttle. It's upstairs. Uh, we call it the flight deck. You can see Piers here. He's working on the network. One of the first things we did when we got on orbit is actually set up a whole computer network up there to help support the things that we do. I'm also at the computer now getting ready for undocking. And uh, just take a quick look around here. You can see how different the shuttle flight deck looks from the business end of the station. We have thousands of switches here. It looks a lot more like an airplane. And that is because it does because have to become an airplane on entry. It was really an amazing experience to uh, merge our two crews, the 9A crew with the expedition crew. I think the experience of living and working together in zero G is just such a magic environment that it just made us feel very close. It made us feel like a family as we uh, had all this uh, incredible experience together. And as a result, it makes it hard to say goodbye. It's hard to say goodbye. Yes, there's some tears shed, especially Peggy and Sandy. It was very hard to say goodbye. The commander's shaking hands one last time as we prepare to close the hatch and get ready for undocking. And here you see the shuttle backing away and listen carefully. Atlantis departing. Thank you, Peggy. As Peggy uh, performs what has become a tradition, there's a ship's bell aboard the station and she rang us off uh, in keeping with an old naval tradition. We uh, use the thrusters of the shuttle to actually push ourselves away from the station. This looks probably a whole lot like the docking did. We all had different responsibilities during the undocking. We're all operating various pieces of equipment. But what we really wanted to do was all cram into the windows and look at the magical site. It's, very, uh, it's a very emotional time to see the S-1 truss and to fly around the station in a big arc, uh, which is what we do. We could look at the station from all different angles. The reason why we do that is to take pictures. We're documenting the station as it exists in this configuration, both for future crews and also for maintenance. But this is a, a tremendous feeling to look at the S-1 truss and think about the station as it will become in the future, as it's shown here, how much bigger it's going to get. And we're very proud of our small part in creating this huge international laboratory in space. It was, it's a very, very uh, wonderful feeling to back away and know that you've been a part of that. And also very rewarding to see an empty payload bay of your shuttle.
After the shuttle's left station, there's about a day and a half of uh, going around in Earth orbit and getting ready to come home, looking at some excellent wine country in Italy. There's Suez again, beautiful views, uh, taking a whole lot of Earth observing pictures and performing our own experiments. This is Sandy trying to pick up as many M&Ms in one go as she can, So sort of like <laughs> plankton and a whale. Dave is using, I think, a mixture of chewing gum and chicken to keep his food stuck to a tortilla. <laughs> Various uh, measures of success. Uh, Dave needs constant grooming. <laughs> and uh, this is Jeff doing his part to, to keep the shuttle clean, uh, starting with Jeff, Dave. Jeff tells us he works for peanuts, and <laughs> here he is working for peanuts. And there comes a time when you've got to get ready to go home. Um, close the payload doors is uh, part of one of the big landmarks in this process. And then we start working on converting the shuttle from being an orbiting uh, spacecraft into a very heavy high-tech glider. Get all the gear together, put the seats in place, put some systems asleep, get into our uh, pressure suits, and get ready for the entry itself. Well, we're whipping around the Earth at about 25 times the speed of sound. And so in order to slow down, we do a small um, burn over Australia, and we come crashing into the atmosphere over Hawaii, using the belly of the orbiter to aerodynamically break us. We come up across Central America, doing about 14 times the speed of sound over the Gulf of Mexico, and then up over the panhandle of Florida. Uh, Pam and I and Sandy are using the instruments to monitor our progress, and about 50,000 feet, about four minutes before landing, um, I took over control of Atlantis for the landing. Uh, I passed it over to Pam for about 30 seconds of practice and then uh, took it back. This is the view out of um, Pam's uh, gun sight or heads-up display. We made the turn to line ourselves up with the runway at uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. and We came down about traveling about 350 miles an hour. As we round out and pull out of our dive, Pam lowered the landing gear and we lined up on the, on the center line and flared Atlantis out for a landing. Now remember, there's no power here. This is our only chance to land, so we've got to do it right the first time. As we roll out in the beautiful Florida sun, all I could think about was get this thing on center line for the final pictures. <laughs> I almost forgot to put on the brakes. You can see we came pretty close there. <laughs> 